Hi, so welcome to the Interim Whisper. This is Isabella Johnston, founder of uh, Employers for Change. And today's guest is somebody I've known for a while, Michael Weiss. He is the CEO of Roomrite. I met him through UCF's incubator. He's going to give you a lot of background about entrepreneurism and how he got inspired. He graduated with a master's in communications from UCF and launched his career by working in the events industry. He obtained a position with UCF and he helps startup companies with their businesses and he has launched his own and one money people. He's a big deal. He's one money. So our show is always about learning technology and the futures of industries and jobs. So Mike, tell us about yourself using only five words. And the first year word you gave me before we started was thoughtful. Why thoughtful? I think that's something your mother told you. <laughs> um, thoughtful. I mean, I guess it could be used in a lot of different ways. It's I use it to just sort of listen and understand kind of the, the context or perspective of when someone else is talking. I think that provides a sense of empathy, a thought, uh, some sense of, of patience, some sense of, um, again, context to, to respond in a way that's helpful. I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, your second word was considerate. Uh, yeah, I, uh, don't know why i think it's just an age just taking people's feelings into consideration and and how best to um to again empathize with with others do you think that those words tend to cross over i mean i do but you know there's still distinct differences about them yeah i think there's a, a lot of overlap there mm-hmm so sometimes people will ask me, well, what is that? Uh, because, you know, with some of the words that I say, and I have to break them down so that they can see the difference. So here's one freelancer versus uh, I know it seems off topic, but it is not freelance versus contractor. We'll save that for a later time, but I'm just using that as a demonstration. Your sure. third word was patient. I would describe you to that to a T. You're <laughs> very patient. Absolutely. I just, again, it goes along with being thoughtful and, and considerate, just taking your time to understand the situation, the context, and the, you know, the best way to, to respond and um, to deliver the best possible result with your response. Mm -hmm. People are messy. So you have to be super considerate, patient, and be able to um, give them thoughtful responses so they feel heard and seen. Right. I would definitely say yes, that is that is something very important. Okay, so fourth one, creative. I've always been someone that um that I don't know if it that just likes to find interesting or fun or or different uh takes on things. Uh you know, one of an internship that I had uh, was in, in the professional sports industry and um, there was a new sort of minor league basketball league that was getting started. And uh, the organization I was with was going to sort of manage or own or, or in some way work with um, one of the, one of the teams with this new league. And all we had was a, a team name and we had to come up with, slogans and, and different things and first example i had was the one that got that got used um just always kind of just as, as like maybe it goes back to you know being patient and, and thoughtful it's just taking in information and being able to put out something that's that's creative and fun and interesting so what was the slogan so the name of the team i think was the pitbulls and uh, the slogan because we were trying to get ready to to generate, I think season tickets. It's like Pitbulls Unleashed or something like that. Oh yeah, um, and just that's that's the first one we got thrown out. Everybody was like, "Yep." So it's a good experience. Yeah, that's funny because Pitbulls are seen as very you know that's also very scary, right? So yeah. it's perpetuating the um, illusion that Pitbulls are 
super dangerous animals. It's kind of like guns. You know, guns are only dangerous because of people, and people make um, pit bulls mean, I think. So, I mean, I guess sometimes, um, I think in this context, it was more of, um, you know, the, we have a, a team that's going to do, uh, some great things. So one of the players on the team was actually a former NBA player, um, Tim Hardaway. And, you know, that was one of the big draws of the team and just getting people excited about the potential of this team. So it was just sort of unleashing the potential, but also the play unleashing and the type of dog. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Was that your school's uh, mascot? No, just uh, uh, the organization sort of oversaw the Florida Panthers and oh. uh, again, the six, this uh, minor league uh, basketball team. And so we were kind of responsible for a lot of the, the marketing for, for those organizations and teams. That had to have been a lot of fun. So last word pragmatic now that one's very different from all of the others how do you define <laughs> pragmatic first um i, I think it, it it goes back to the the other things it's being able to make decisions based off of the 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 data that you have and again being patient being thoughtful being considerate um it all goes into what the next uh decision is or the next word you say or, or the action you take. Yeah, that would be true. Hmm. So, so that's a very good, I, I know that when I've worked with you on many times, I, I know that you sit and you weigh a lot of things when we yeah. are chatting about, <laughs> okay, what if we do this? What could possibly happen over here? Yeah. Um. So, yeah. Those are really solid words. I think that what you should do is go back to your parents, ask your parents to say, would you, you think these words describe me? And if not, what words would you use? And you should probably ask your daughter. I don't know if she knows pragmatic. Uh, she might, she has a pretty big vocabulary for, oh, really? for an eight year old. Um, what was the thing that she said the other day? It was, so we were fostering a dog and I would describe the dog as wild she describes him as rambunctious. Wow, that's a big word for a five an eight year old. Right. Right. Yeah. Is she a good <laughs> speller? Because maybe she was learning how to spell that word also. Could be. I mean, we we read with her every night. She listens to audiobooks. So it's just you know, taking in all those those words and information. But yeah, maybe she's learning to spell that word too. Yeah. There's research. I was an English uh major and English teacher. So there's research that shows that when you read to children, it expands their vocabulary. So you keep doing that because she'll remember that if you keep doing it all the way up to 18. Mm -hmm. And fun fact, I, I know this is true. When I taught uh, high school, I would read to the 16 year olds and I wanted them to be quiet in the last five minutes of class. And so, man, they would pack their books up really fast and they would lay their heads down on the table and they would listen to me read. And I tell you, it's a really sweet memory. So you keep doing that with your daughter. She's going to love it. Yeah. Well, you. thank you. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your educational background. Where did you go to college? How did you end up where you are here? And then where did this idea come from for your startup? So uh, I did my undergraduate degree at Florida Atlantic University in, in Boca Raton. Um, I did that because in my senior year of high school, uh, I got a job at the Florida Panthers with the National Hockey League and thought maybe a career in, in sports, uh, sports management would be, sounded interesting and uh, decided to stay home so I could continue that job and make contacts and gain experience. Um, and I ended up working for the Florida Panthers for about four years between part-time jobs and internships. Uh, and I'm glad I did that because, um, you know, a few months before graduation, I was applying for jobs and getting job offers because I had so much experience in that field. Uh, and then got a job, uh, in Winter Park with, a an event management company that had sports properties. And so I ended up working uh, for that company before I officially graduated with my degree. Um, and then did that for a few years and then decided to pursue a master's degree at the University of Central Florida. Uh, got that done in about two years. Um, and then 
started working for UCF and their uh, hospitality management college. And that later transitioned it into the UCF business incubator where I was helping startup companies with communications and marketing and business development, things I was doing while working for sports teams and, and the event management company that I was working with. Are you the only one that has two properties with UCF that you oversee? Uh, no. So our director oversees well, technically all of them, but directly works with, I think, three of them. Hmm. That's Carol Ann? Yes, Carol Ann. Uh, she oversees our research park incubator, our photonics incubator over at uh, on the main campus, and also the uh, Lake Nona Life Sciences Incubator. So interesting. I think Absolutely. that you you guys are so lucky that you get to be exposed to really cool things all the time. So what made you decide to launch your own startup? Uh, it was in the process of trying to, to solve a problem that I was experiencing. I was planning a family reunion uh, in a destination and time of year where there was very little hotels available and the ones that were available were extremely overpriced because there was so much demand and very little inventory. And I discovered that there was a, a conference going on uh, same time of year, same destination. I thought about booking into their room block because I knew conferences have a block of rooms at the hotel that usually are offered at a discounted rate. Um, didn't do it because I didn't know what kind of, you know, chaos that would create, but uh, it made me wonder how often conferences have rooms just that don't get booked in their room block, and would they be open to to selling them to, to consumers? Um, and so I was doing some research and found out there were certain events that had a lot of attrition with their rooms, and uh, thought, well, maybe if there was a marketplace where they could list these rooms, and a, a marketplace where the consumers could buy these rooms at the discounted rate that they would offer their attendees. And I ran this idea by an acquaintance who I knew was somehow involved in the events industry. And she said, yes, this is a huge problem. This is, you know, a solution that, that solves a lot of different problems with, um, within that space. And I remember, and I've told her this a few times, when I told her the concept, just like, it was almost like I discovered fire or, or gold by accident. Yeah. It was just like, yes, that, that checks all these different boxes. Um, and so she ended up becoming my, my co-founder. Um, and then shortly after that, a uh, gentleman had reached out to me just wanting to you know, get involved in the startup community and um, his background was exactly what we needed for a CTO and shared what with, with him what we were developing and he became our third co-founder. And so we had the industry perspective, the business perspective and the, and the technology perspective. And it was just sort of so serendipitous that all the time, that everything was happening at the right place at the right time with the right wow. people. And were you lucky? How did you meet those people? Was it through like one million cups, or was it just because you were, you know, heavily immersed in the, I guess, the hospitality industry before? Or how how did you get that? That is just, rare to get that. Just being involved in the the startup um, community was just, you know, but again, our CTO was saying, uh, the person who who's currently our CTO was asking, you know, how do I get involved with startups? And I mentioned a few things and I also shared what I was working on. And he had worked for several, you know, event tech, hotel tech companies as, as a CTO uh, startup, a CTO startup and had exits and knew exactly what we were talking about and knew the, the technology that we were, uh, the stack that we were using. Um, his previous startup was, uh, used it on a very similar tech stack. So it was just the right skill set, the right experience, just pure, pure luck. Yeah. And so from there you went and you entered into um, Rollins College. They had their venture pitch and you won prize money. How much did you win? And what was your prize? 
place, yeah. whatever. So, so I think there were roughly 60 uh, startups that applied for the competition over the course of a couple of rounds, got whittled down to four finalists and, and our company room, right? was one of the, the four finalists. Uh, we placed fourth um, and we received about $5,000. Um, but more importantly, we received uh, a lot of positive feedback, some awareness. And I had several people that night after I got off the stage and the event ended, they came up to me and said, that problem just happened to me. And it was, it, it, it happens so often where events, whether they're, they're corporations or associations, um, it just happens all the time. Um, and so it was sort of validating to hear people in this room have a problem and agree that we're, we have a solution to that problem, the perfect solution to that problem. Mm. Uh, so that was rewarding. Yeah, I bet it was. And recently I saw that you had gone, I think it was last month. Where was it? You went to Nevada, Arizona? Yes. Yeah, so we went to Las Vegas. Uh, there was an event called uh, Event Tech Live. It was, you know, the people from around the world who had technology for uh, events and conferences um, and across so many different spectrums, but we were there, we participated in their startup competition and, and took home second place in that. And do you know how much you got? Uh, I don't know what the value of it is, but we won some marketing spend with the organization that puts on it. Um, Event Industry News is the organization that puts that on and it's one of the bigger trade publications. So we're excited to get some, some ads and some editorials, um, uh, uh, on their site very soon. Yeah. Well, that's a big deal because that Absolutely. could have been 5,000 and, you know, services can go a long way Absolutely. just as much as money. Yeah. Because if they like you a lot, sometimes they might even give you more. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So that's pretty exciting. I know that you and I had talked uh, before it, we went on the air and you had said that your dad is an entrepreneur. So I'm guessing that's where you got your inspiration, but what type of business did he launch? Maybe. I mean, he's had a lot of different companies over the years, some that have sold, some that have just sort of, you know, transitioned out of. Uh, they're all service-based uh, position, uh, service-based companies. So um, he had a uh, a company where he would rent out um, furniture, another one where um, he was a, a locksmith for a while, um, a window washer, um, just again, a lot of, a lot of services, um, but, you know, had, has been doing it since, you know, his, his early twenties. So uh, he, he did well with it. Um, I don't know if it, if it stemmed from him or just again, the, the sense of creativity, but I remember being in, uh, second grade and the big thing back then was uh, uh, the cartoon show uh, X-Men and everybody had trading cards and I remember I would save up my allowance buy a pack of cards and I noticed over time I would get the same card over and over again and started selling them in class to my friends who wanted the cards that didn't have it um, and was able to, to build up a little a little business that way and that was my first uh, foray into entrepreneurship. Mm. Yeah. So that's pretty smart. And did you discuss that? Because I can't imagine a second grader, I, they're such babies still, right? Yeah. Going, that, you're like seven and you're going, Hey, do you want to pay $2 for this? Like, you know, is that where you were, you were smart enough to know the, the money side of it and how it could really provide? I think so. Um, I, I, I know that I was, buying a pack of cards for $3. And yeah, I think you got you know five or six cards in a pack and getting a lot of the same ones. And I knew my friends were interested in them, and sold them for like a dollar a piece and bought more cards and continued that until eventually the, the teacher realized I was doing it during class and took <laughs> them away and gave me detention. Oh, that's so wrong. You get penalized for being a, an yeah. entrepreneur. Uh, and that's the, you know, the irony of that. Every teacher has to have a side business. <laughs> Maybe she was selling that. So you're cutting into her profit, whatever. I guess it was on her turf. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She has to protect it. So yeah. funny. 
<laughs> so that's interesting. So why did you, um, how did you end up getting the job with uh, the UCF incubator? Because, I mean, you were doing some pretty cool things by being in this. Okay, it's hard to get into the sports industry. You literally, what I have been told by people at the um, Orlando Magic is you have to know somebody to be able to get in there. Because it's so, everybody wants to be in sports. Everybody does want to be in sports. And I, for better or for worse, um, I remember already having a job in sports. And the CEO of the Panthers at the time uh, was like sort of the keynote speaker at this career fair. And he was, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but what he was basically saying is, there are so many people in sports and, um, you know, fortunately, unless you're at the top, there's not a whole lot of money to be made because there's always people that are wanting to get, you know, get their foot in the door. Um, and he didn't share that to discourage people, but rather to encourage people to work really hard so they could get to the top and sort of, you know, break through to, to the side where it's, it's um, lucrative to be in that. Um, and I remember that, uh, pretty vividly, uh, but I don't know that it's maybe things have changed in the last you know twenty plus years. But um, it wasn't so much you need to know somebody. It's just are you willing to work for not much pay? That was oh no, that's true. No, this is the Orlando Magic. Okay, so I'm not naming names. I noted sure. you noticed you have been very discreet. You did not mention anybody's name here unless I mentioned it. <laughs> and I feel like you should have said your CTO and your other person's name, but that's okay. But I'm not going to mention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. Cause like, they're going, what you were on a podcast. Where's my name? So, Absolutely. yeah. So at the Orlando magic, I was told that, um, gosh, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this, but um, that it's really, you know, who, who do you know over there? And they only want, because they get so many applications, it's just like, oh, well, this person has all of the qualities that we're looking sure. for. We know this person. So they don't have to go very far, literally a tissue, not a rock, a tissue. And that's how close they are, you know? So- mm -hmm. If that's the case, and they do have to work hard, and they are not paid anything, and people do it willingly because they want to get into that as an industry. Absolutely. I mean, you got to, any industry, you got to start somewhere. Um, and some industries are more sort of saturated and competitive than others. Um, and sports is, I mean, it's a very exciting thing to be a part of because uh, it's sort of bigger than than yourself um mm -hmm. and it comes with you know some some perks but uh but it is long hours it's you know at least back then it wasn't much pay yeah. and um you know you just gotta again like 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 that ceo said you gotta put in the hard work and break through to the other side to to be really successful at it i don't know about you but um and you're just a baby in my opinion of a you know a real startup because sure. you know selling the cards that was smart in second grade, but this is the hardest thing I think I've ever done in my whole life. And I've been through yeah. death of a family member, multiple moves, you know, like a divorce, all kinds of like, and worse things than that. Yeah. And I sit here and I go, gosh, this is something that we choose every day to torture ourselves with. And it can be incredibly hard. Absolutely. It is, it is hard. I've, I've said more than one occasion is the, the most difficult thing that I've done um there are, are highs and lows and yeah um you just gotta know when when it's low there's there's a high that's coming and just gotta ride that wave until you get there oh gosh so incredibly hard so one of your favorite thought leaders and why yeah um <laughs> a, a book that i read uh maybe within the last month or two is uh, called burn, burn the boats and it's written by matt higgins uh he's got incredible personal uh story and journey that he shares in the book uh but also the the philosophy of burn your boats where that really comes from is um not necessarily uh military but i think it was the spanish conquistadors ah, uh when I they can were help you well, i looked it up 
Spanish That's... expedition in 1519, and Hernan Cortez landed in Mexico. I bet you can That's take right. the rest of the story over. Right. And the, 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 the philosophy is if the boats are still there, you can retreat, go back on the boats, sail back to, to Spain. But if you burn the boats, there's no plan B. You have yeah. to succeed or, or die trying. Um, and so with, with, with startups, it's kind of the same thing. There's, there's so much adversity. And if you sort of have your, your plan B or safety net, it makes it very difficult to, to be all in. Um, and there's, as we just discussed, it's the hardest thing we've ever done. And, you know, that philosophy of, of burning the boats, you know, when I, when I read the book, I was so motivated by the very first chapter, <laughs> but the rest yeah. of this, the rest of his personal <laughs> journey and the, the, the experiences that he shares with, with other entrepreneurs, um, it's just, you know, it's very inspiring and, 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 and motivating. Yeah. It says he was a high school dropout yeah. a high and very unlikely success, but he was also smart. And he figured that out very quickly. Absolutely. Um, his uh, one of the one of the early stories he shares about his his personal journey is he dropped out of high school, I think, in his sophomore junior year, not because he couldn't hack it, but because he realized he could get his GED if he did that and then start working after he got his GED. So it wasn't because of laziness. It was to get ahead faster. And mm. it worked. That is very, very interesting. Okay, um, we're going to go to another question here. I'm not going to do the thing with Wonder Woman because I already went and did that. Um, you have three days left to live. What would you do in those three days? And be very specific. You can't say just be with family. What would you do with your family? Um, I guess try to savor every moment that you have left. Um, I do think playing with my eight-year-old would be priority, spending time with my wife, spending time with my parents and siblings, um, you know, knowing if you only had three days left, you'd want to just have every conversation you can have, have, enjoy every every moment that there is. And um, I don't, I'm not sure what we would do. Hopefully it would be something fun that we could all celebrate, And, and but I, I don't. I don't have any specifics beyond that. I'm going to tell you, you probably haven't had somebody in your family that has passed away. So that's might be why I can tell you my mom, when um, she had leukemia before she died, it was literally the day before she died. My brother and I, we asked her to each call us and leave a voice message on our phone. Mm -hmm. I have only been able to listen to that once. But I find so much comfort knowing that it is there and I can go back and do that. And when I talk with my dad, which is about every other week, I ask my dad to tell me stories because I like the the stories that come out of it. You know, like when you were two, you used to drag the chair, blah, 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 and, you know, wash, dry the dishes, you know, and stand on the chair. And so those things make really good memories. And I would say that is what I would do. It's like, go back and think about what is it that I wanted uh, from that relationship and what could I give that other person? I agree. I, I do that with my, my, my daughter's only eight, but you know, I share stories of when she was, you know, two and three and, and so on. And, you know, I could see her reaction and smile and, and all that. So that, that, that's, that's a good idea you know, to tell yeah. stories. And I read this, I, well, I read that. No, did I read it? No, I saw it on, um, it was on, I think a YouTube thing. Um, I think this is a really good idea too. I I've started doing this as a birthday present for um, when I get invited to a kid's birthday present party or a wedding or uh, a baby shower, I give a book, it's a journal. And in the journal, I, what you do is you ask everybody at that special moment of that person's in life. So whether it's an anniversary or a birthday or whatever, um, you ask everybody to leave a, a thought, uh, a prayer, uh, something about what that person has been like for a year. And they get that book when they turn 18 or at their wedding or some significant moment, because then they can go back over it and see all of these people 
that have been in their lives and have wished them well. And I went, you know, that is the coolest idea. Absolutely. I, I think that's a great idea. Yeah. So you could start doing that with your daughter's birthday. When next one, when it rolls up, you have a journal, you ask everybody to, you know, in the family and the friends, just write her a note and then you save it for when she's 18. She doesn't get to read it until then. We could do that for our, for ourselves. I know she has a journal herself that, you know, writes and notes and, and things like that, but one that we write for her, that's, that's another way to, of, of doing it. Yeah. That becomes something um, that's really valuable, you know, three days. Do you know how many people live, how, how many days you're alive? This is a, the average lifespan, um, average lifespan. I looked it up and it's like 27, 27,000. I'm going to look it up while we're talking because sure. it's significant. It's uh, the average lifespan is 77.5 years, which comes to a total of 20 and numbered days. Um, and that's why that's where my uh, question came from is like, it's 29,200 days for an 80 year old, but it's less than that if it's 20, a 75 year old. So I sat there and I went, wow, if I only have 27,000 days left on, you know, in my life, what am I doing with every day? And what would I do with my last three? If I knew that was my last three, a day, a day is so short. And to think about 80 years or 75 years, you sit here and go, Oh, that's a lot of time. But when you think about it as 27,250 days, I'm just going to use that as the average. I go in a day, I could make a difference to one person. And so that's where that question came from, because that's why I think I'm stressing it is because I don't think that people realize the power that what you have in your average day and how you can be extraordinary for somebody else. Absolutely. That's a good way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so what would you want to be remembered for in your life? Being a good person, mm -hmm. being helpful, being supportive, being a good parent and husband and friend and sibling and son. Um, yeah. I mean, but I, so many things, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And you've got all of those key words up there with thoughtful and, you know, you had considerate, patient, creative, all of those things tie into that. So we're going to take a few moments to acknowledge our sponsor, Cat5 Studios, and we will be right back. The Intern Whisperer is brought to you by Cat5 Studios, who help you create games and videos for your training and marketing needs that are out of this world. Visit Cat5 Studios for more information to learn how Cat5 Studios can help your business. Thank you, Cat5 Studios. So what do you think in this half of the show, we talk about what will 2030 look like? Have you seen Black Mirror? No. Oh, super scary. Okay. So um, Black Mirror, it's very dark uh, mm -hmm. about, you know, and they use a lot of AR, um, VR type of situations and what it could be in AI. Mm -hmm. um, there's also another one on Netflix that's a ray of hope and positive, and it's called The Future Of. You can watch that one safely with your child. Uh, and she will feel very good because it's like how you can understand dogs talking and, you know, what you're going to be living in. And it's going to be a, a botanist that is now your your home because your home is covered in plants, like things like that. It's really cool. Anyway, what do you think 2030 would look like? Because that's like right around the corner. You know, this is 2024. It doesn't count. So basically five years. You know, I don't. <laughs> I don't know if it's just the the pragmatist in me or or maybe it's even just a, some cynicism but i don't think it's going to look that much different i think really? things things are going to be a little bit more convenient a little bit more um uh i mean convenience by the, the, the best word to use uh you know maybe faster or efficient but i mean it it just seems like you know 10 years ago the world wasn't that different. And so to think that the future is going to be vastly different than it is from now is, uh, I don't know, maybe it's it's possible, but I think it's just going to be slightly more efficient 
But you don't think way. COVID switched the gears on us? Because that was like overnight when we had COVID. Bam, everybody has to go and work from home. Nobody can be around each other. All types of uh, opportunities for jobs and career paths opened up because now people were delivering everything to you. You know, it wasn't just Amazon Prime. I sat there and went in that one moment of time, everything changed. And I think it also happened with 9-11. I think there's always these one significant historical moments in time where everything changes. There's, there's going to be events like that. And you're, and you're right, COVID did, did change some things. But there are also some of those things have kind of reverted back to pre-pandemic. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, people, some people do still work remotely, but a lot of people have gone back to the office for, you know, <laughs> one reason or another. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, who knows? I, 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 uh, I'm very curious to see what it'll be like in, you know, another six years or so. Yeah. It's hard to imagine. Um, I sit here and I go, well, we do have supposedly we have flying cars, right? And we have things that allow us to drive autonomously. I don't know. I, I sit here and go, how many of those will actually be on the road? That's what I always wonder about. So uh, yeah, for, for what it's worth, and um, you know, a couple of years ago, Web3 and, and cryptocurrency and blockchain, I mean, these were buzzwords and this is where the future was heading. And now it still exists, but not it doesn't have the same, um, you know, credence or importance that it had a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And right now, yeah, the buzz is, um, you know, artificial intelligence and evitals and other things. And, you know, some of those things will evolve and some of those things I think will kind of fall by the wayside, but um, you know, we'll see what it looks like. But uh, I, I don't know if we'll, we will or we won't have flying cars in the next six years. Well, what about your industry? I know, do you, do you think augmented reality is going to be changing how people experience travel and hotel stays? Like I could do it. And and what would we charge for that? Because would a hotel go and charge for an augmented reality stay so it feels like it? I could see them creating that a trip to Hawaii. I want to stay at the season's 52, then I need to know what that is like. And they could create an augmented reality vacation for me. And it wouldn't cost me as nearly as much if I went there. You know, I think the hospitality and, and travel industry is, is, I guess, to my earlier point, it's going to be a little bit more convenient and, and, and efficient. And I also think fun and in different ways. Um, you know, I think where augmented reality is being used right now is, you know, if you go to a museum, you can use your phone and get some information about, um, you know, an exhibit that you just can't get, you know, off of, off of, a, you know, a plaque or, or, um, you know, just from what you're seeing or from a tour guide. You know, one example is you could see the skeletal structure of a dinosaur, but if you use an app, you can actually see what that dinosaur looks like with its skin, even though in, in person it's just bones, but with the app you can see what it would look like but it's, you know it's flesh and it's skin um but i also think you know you could use things to uh you know if you're just sort of on a, on you know traveling in a city somewhere where you can find things or where certain historical events have happened uh through the through this app um if you're on a on a flight somewhere you can see if you're passing by you know uh, you know, that flying over the Rockies or something like that, you can see where certain milestones were, were achieved there. Um, so I think it's just going to be used in a lot of different ways to make things more interesting, more fun, and, and you know, more efficient. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's an easier way to, to position things in that way. Okay, so any ethics? Do you think that there's going to be ethical dilemmas with using any type of augmented reality or... Or having those kind of experiences, um, I think it'll be controlled to some extent. Um, you know, I, I don't know that you know a museum or a, you know a, a, a destination marketing organization is going to put out an app that isn't sort of controlled its content. I mean, I suppose a third party can put out their own app and make things up or or do some nefarious things, but. Um, I think there there are certain guardrails that'll that'll keep it honest. 
Mm -hmm. I think that um, I noticed when AI launched, and that was another significant point in time, right? Last year. Oh, everything changed. To me, what AI is, is when we were using chat GPT when it came out last year, is it's like doing a Google search, but on steroids. And it would make it so it was instead of me having to read, I don't know, 20 entries and be able to put something together, it was doing it for me. And it's finding truth. And it's finding the things that are not true. And mm -hmm. then it puts it all together. And it's still up to me as the person that's using AI as a way to, well, I need to determine what's real and what's not so that I'm really providing a report that's valid, right? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, it, I think just just about anything can be used in, in sort of nefarious ways. But I also think it's going to do more more good than harm. Um, you know, I know in, in the events industry, um, you know, AI is being used to do everything from create, uh, graphics for events, get people, you know, excited and capture things in a very specific way. Um, you know, writing content for, for different things. Um, it, it I know from, you know, event and meeting professionals perspectives, it's, it's going to be a, a handy tool, um, now, I, I, I'm sure there's going to be some way where it's going to be used in in the wrong in the wrong sense. But you know, I mean, you're always going to have some bad actors, but a lot of good to overcome the bad. Yeah, I think it does require having um, people that are always out there, not necessarily to regulate, but to ensure best practices are maintained. And if they see something like you said going off the rails, that they're going to be um, quick <laughs> to be able to stop those things from happening so you don't see bad things happening. Sure. All right. So hard to believe, but this has been an hour. So best mentoring advice that you want to share with our listeners about the future. About the future. Um, <laughs> I don't know if, if this is the, the best advice, but I think it's interesting advice. I had a, I had a friend who used to always, and I don't know if this is his saying, but he used to say it all the time is, sometimes wrong turns lead to right places. And I think if you apply that towards um, you know, entrepreneurship or innovation, you know, going in a different direction that, that could lead you to a right place in terms of a market, in terms of opportunity, in terms of, you know, who knows relationships. But um, I think those are some interesting way to look at life. You know what? That's solid. I like that one. Yeah. Being open to what can happen. Even the mistakes can provide good learning experiences for sure. So how can our listeners find you? Now we have the roomright.io website, and then I also have your LinkedIn uh, link, but is there anything else that you want to share where they can reach you or learn more or anything? Uh, those are probably the two best places to to do that. Um, you know, we, we've exhibited a number of events, so if you're at uh, one of those, please come come by. Um, but yeah, those are the website and LinkedIn are probably the best ways to to, to reach us. Um, before we go, wanted to give that that shout out to my co-founder since I didn't get an opportunity to do that sooner. Um, so Teresa Guastella is our chief industry relations officer. Um, has, has worked in both the hotel industry and, and the meeting planning industry for for a, a long time and, and really knows the ins and outs of our of our industry. And then uh, Tom Murphy is our chief technology officer. He's been the CTO of a number of exited startups in the event tech space. Um, and both of them have been great friends, great co-founders and, and great people. Yeah, I remember seeing them at the Rollins Venture Pitch. So yeah. That's right. Yeah. They were super, super uh, cheerleaders for you. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, Mike, I want to tell you, thank you so much. It's been delightful to have you as a guest on the podcast. Um, your episode is 300, by the way. So it's right. a, a significant <laughs> milestone. I think that bodes well for you. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. It's an honor. Yeah. So it'll be launching next week. So Keep your make sure that you subscribe to us on YouTube and also on uh, your favorite streaming channel for audio. Thank you. All right, you take care. Bye.
too. Bye-bye. Thank you to our sponsor, Cat5 Studios, and thank you to our video editing team, Max Stein, Luke Balaja, and Chris Rodriguez. Music is by Sophie Lloyd. Visit Employers for Change at www.e4c.tech to learn how you can recruit, assess, and improve employee learning and company culture through DEI skills hiring and learning. Mention you listen to the show when you join and become a member and you may win a chance to be a guest on the Intern Whisperer podcast. Subscribe today to our podcast and support the Intern Whisperer by sharing, leaving us comments and reviews. You can find the Intern Whisperer podcast on Employers for Change YouTube channel or streaming from your favorite podcast channel.